Today, we will cover uh, some basic concepts and failure modes for self-time circuits. Uh, go over some terminology, and then maybe if we have time, we'll go over the isochronic torque assumption. So the first thing to note uh, is when we're looking at a transition, uh, we, you know, we have this uh, voltage, output voltage, it starts at VDD, and then uh, our, uh, our NMOS stack starts to pull the uh, output voltage down from VDD to ground. Now, when the gate of that NMOS stack, when the gates of that NMOS stack are on and, and allowed to, to pull um, charge away from that node and down to ground, uh, we call that production rule enabled, uh, meaning it is allowed to execute. Uh, when it finally does cross the threshold voltage, we say that that production rule has fired. Uh, so when, when the, uh, the condition for the production rule is true, then the production rule is enabled, and then when that, fin when that production rule finally is executed, that production rule fires. Uh, notice that this happens not when the voltage reaches ground, but when the voltage reaches the threshold voltage. Um, this allows, this basically enables the next transition on the subsequent gate. So if we set up a really simple uh, NMOS and PMOS stack here with two different uh, variables, A and B, and then we start toggling them separately, we can, we can get into kind of different uh, scenarios. The first scenario, uh, B is, uh, is low and A is low, right? And so in this case, the output C will be inverted and will uh, come out high. Uh, shown by the red here. But then we let A transition high, and now both transistors are enabled, and they're both trying to drive C. What will happen is there will be a short from VDE to ground through, through these two transistors, and we call this interference. And so interference can uh, ultimately damage the circuit, it, it will bring the circuit out of a well-known state uh, and could mess with the handshake expansion. Uh, it can do a lot of different things. And so you'll notice that, you know, we can get into that state in any, any, any number of ways, mostly just if they're both on, then uh, we'll, we'll end up somewhere with an output voltage of 5.5. The two transistors will act like a voltage divider. So both are enabled, um, and then the current, whenever both are enabled, we get a short, and so the current spikes uh, quite significantly, uh, ultimately burning out those transistors. Uh, the alternative is that uh, neither transistors on A or B are enabled, in which case C is left kind of undriven. And we call this uh, a floating node, right? So uh, or a dynamic node. Effectively, the output voltage will just start to wander off as a result of inductive uh, noise. And this could go any direction. This could go up, this could go down, this could go away from your voltage rails in any weird way. Um, Spice doesn't have a, an effective way to simulate this because there's no external noise source. So it just kind of has it wander off uh, below ground. Uh, and the final kind of failure mode for cell tone circuits uh, for a signal on a cell tone circuit is instability. This is also known as a glitch uh, in uh, synchronous design. Effectively, what, what happens is a, a production rule is enabled, but then is disabled before being able to fire. And so this creates this spike that, that starts to bring the voltage down or up. And then uh, when, the, when the production rule is disabled, it's, it's no longer able to drive the node and it's brought back up to uh, its original value. Now, this glitch can then propagate out through the rest of the circuit, particularly if the voltage was allowed to drop below the threshold voltage um, of the next gate. And so we can have 
different size glitches and each one is each bigger glitch is more and more dangerous for the circuit. So generally we want to design our circuits to avoid these instabilities. So PR sim will report uh, interference to you and it'll report instability to you, an unstable signal. Uh, and then uh, we'll kind of walk through how to debug that. So the way that you prevent these failure modes uh, is by guaranteeing uh, acknowledgement. Um, now, acknowledgement is a little weird. It basically is just talking about the, the two cycles that you see here in this circuit. Uh, every uh, gate has to be part of a cycle, and those cycles have to be synchronized correctly. And so acknowledgement basically says that for a transition T1, that transition acknowledges uh, another transition T2 uh, coming into this gate. If there's a sequence of events from T1 to T2 that prevents it from, from happening until T1 has completed. So basically, this signal is not allowed to change until we get through this cycle. Right, so it, it ensures that T1, after T1 is enabled, that it does fire, and then that fire, that firing on T1 propagates back around to T2 before the next cycle. And so for, if your circuit is entirely delay insensitive, then every input transition to a gate must be acknowledged by an output transition. Um, however, Delay insensitive circuits are not Turing complete. And so it turns out neither, uh, so it turns out CMOS as a whole is not Turing, is not delay insensitive uh, because um, the a transistor, either NMOS or PMOS, or a transistor stack, does not by default acknowledge both transitions on the input uh, signals. And so we we have this kind of extra timing assumption, and quasi delay insensitive circuits allow for this extra timing assumption. So it's somewhat delay insensitive. Uh, and so both of our, if we look at this gate C, uh, uh, some kind of message. If we look at this gate C, uh, the C element, then we have two kind of acknowledgement routes. One is from T1 to this input, and the other is from T1 to the second input. And both are acknowledged by T1. Uh, so that covers uh, kind of failure modes. And we have a decent amount of time to go over some examples. So we're in lecture four. Okay, so in this first example, uh, our goal is to create interference, basically trigger PRSIM to, to complain about interference between these two uh, production rules. And so we have our output, just like in our uh, slides, we have C driven by an NMOS transistor uh, connected to A and a PMOS transistor connected to B. Now we have this uh, resource file, and our goal is to edit the RC file until we've triggered uh, interference on C. And so we'll be using um, set, uh, you know, to set a value on a node. So we can be like set A to one or set B to zero, right? And so our goal is to create interference. So I'm gonna let you guys tackle that. Lecture four, uh, exercise one. The 12 and 36 inside of brackets. Do they mean anything in particular? Yes. So if we look at e1.act, you'll see that we have this 12 inside of uh, corner brackets and 36. Those are transistor sizing relative to the lambda of the technology node. Uh, the lambda is just some feature of the technology node. We have it in the configuration files, and so it's 12 times lambda. Okay. Is there a reason why that's included here? Is that going to change what can cause instabilities? It will not affect the digital simulation, but it will affect the analog simulation. So that's included here to ensure that 
those two transistors have equal drive strength, so you can actually see the 0.5 volt interference on the output. And keeper equals zero. So remember uh, that C elements have this feedback. Um, that's also called a keeper. The little, the little inverter going backwards from the uh, output node of the C element. And so ACT, when compiling, automatically tries to identify locations where it needs a state holding element uh, and put those in for you. If you don't want that, then you need this extra flag on the production rule saying, don't put that in for me. So this is saying, effectively, the zero is fault is a false, so don't put in a keeper. All right, thank you. Yep. So in order to create interference, we need to set both A and B um, to a value that will uh, enable both the C down and C up production rules. And so the C down production rules enabled by A being high. So we can say set A to one. And then the, the C up production rule is enabled by B being low. So we say set B zero, and then we can uh, advance 100 to see what's going on. So then we say uh, make E1. And we PRSIM E1 dot address. Source here's uh, E1 by RC. And here it is. PRSIM is telling us that we have created interference on C. And this was the last transition, A, uh, that caused it. Basically, uh, the, the, the transistor on B was already enabled. And so A transitioning from zero to one was the transition that caused interference in C. As a result, C in the digital simulation, C is transitioned to this X value. Basically, PRSIM can't map it to a digital value, so it's assigned to this X, and this X has various propagation rules, and it'll be allowed to propagate through the circuit, as you'd expect, and have some unknown value to propagate. And so we can take a look at the analog simulation if we go into E1, to PRSIM uh, env.prs, source PRSIM.rc, and off it goes. Uh, and it looks like we may need to step a little further, so advance 100, okay. So now we can say PR view, test.spy.prn to bring up the waveform viewer. We have our two input signals, A and B. We see A go high here, then we have our output signal C, um, and we see that go to about 800 millivolts. And so if we, if we stick ground and VDD in there, we'll be able to see kind of more accurately that it goes to the center, right? So VDD is at 1.8 volts, ground's at zero, C transitions from 1.8 volts to about 900 millivolts. 850. So we've created interference, right? These two things are fighting each other. So that's the first example. The second example goes over instability. So let's take a look at that. So we have two goals here. Trigger an unstable transition on C, and then also trigger a dynamic node on C. Make it so C is not driven. We want to see those two things separately. And so we have our circuit here, which has um, a NAND gate that on uh, from A and B to D, and then we have an inverter out to C. And so this will allow us to see any unstable transition we get on C. So here we're trying to find or create simultaneously. 
a dynamic node and an instability? Separately. Okay. Goal one, create an instability. Goal two, create a dynamic node. Okay. How is there a difference between a weak, unstable error and I think I was getting a full, like a non qualified instability mm -hmm. in the previous, previous example? Uh, so, we can, so the weak instability is reporting a cause of an indeterminate value for B. Would a strong instability or unlawful instability be of both uh, inputs or simultaneously indeterminate? Um, so if you create a glitch, that's a unqualified instability. As that glitch propagates out, it will create weak instabilities in the rest of the circuit. Okay. The difference between the two being? Um, there is a hierarchy. If a strong, if a, like a normal production rule is driving another gate. So let's say you have a, a signal X and you have two things possibly driving X. And one thing is currently driving it high and the other thing has a weak driver then the one that's currently driving it strong will win and it won't propagate your weak instability will not propagate through that signal interesting so that's almost and that's uh, independent of whatever logic is being performed to calculate x because that seems almost like a uh, disjunctive behavior the zero or anything is the anything it, yes, well. it's a it's a disjunctive. So it, it it only happens basically it only matters when you have A or B and you see a weak instability on B and A is driving it strong. Okay. So if it were a conjunctive logic driving the output signal, then it would still propagate. Okay. So in fact, uh, weak instabilities do function as almost a, another logical constant. Yes. Okay. Um, instabilities can still propagate through a driver, a, a, a disjunctive driver. Instabilities, but not weak instabilities, can propagate through a disjunctive driver. Correct. Okay. Does the act, and now is this part of act language specification or is it part of PR sim digital simulation where this hierarchy of instabilities is defined? It's PR sim. Okay. Act the act language specification is largely there to specify transistors. So the simulator is the thing that gives life to the the behavior. Okay. Is there anything else to that hierarchy? Are there any other uh, possible values? I suppose we have dynamic. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a value can be zero, one, or x, uh, and it's it can either be driven strong or weak. Full matrix. So we've got. Uh, six possibilities of. Yes. High low X and strong weak driven? Yes. Okay. Where X is instability, and then mm -hmm. strong versus weak driven instabilities are unqualified versus qualified? Yeah, you can think of X as illegal value for the state space, basically. Mm -hmm. It can be instability, or it can be it was never set, or it can be interference. It's just this is an illegal value. Ah, right. But it can still be a legal value with um, with a strong or weak propagation capability. Correct. When we get to HSC sim, so not all the tools have this particular formalism. HSC sim has a slightly different formalism. And we'll get to that. Okay. So just be aware that the formalism is different. Mm -hmm. So creating uh, an instability was pretty straightforward. We just spam it with uh, 
conflicting highs and lows. Yep. And it, uh, and it isn't able to settle on a consistent value. But for dynamic, dynamic mode, not quite certain how to do that. Okay, so let's let's start with instability. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is we need to turn on, we need to choose which of these uh, uh, rules we want to make unstable, either D down or D up. It'll be easier to make D down unstable. So we start by setting A and B to one. And then um, that will turn on D. So let's actually just set B to one so that we have B set. Um, and then we're going to advance uh, enough time for B to transition. Uh, let's say, um, I don't know, 15. And then we're going to set simultaneously, set A to one, maybe advance three, and then set B to zero. And so three is enough, not enough time for the transition on D to take place. But the moment that A is set to one, D down is enabled. And so we will see D be enabled and then subsequently disabled, creating an instability. So we can say, uh, make E2, Pearson E2.PRS, source E2.RC. Mm. There it is. I didn't advance the last time. And so we see this unstable D.D .D down cause is because B went low, and that propagates out to C with weak interference. Uh, and we see that value, yeah, that X value propagate out to, out to C. Now, of course, B did transition down, so it transitioned back to a valid state. And what that means is that D will transition back to one because it's combinational after it goes unstable, but that instability did propagate out to C, and then C transitioned back to zero since it was an inver inverter. So, PRSIM handles the glitch effectively as a as the propagation of an X value, uh, followed by uh, a um, full fully driven value after that, assuming that the the element wasn't state holding, and if it was state holding, then that X value will remain. Just to confirm, so weak interference on C here is that is distinct from a dynamic. On uh, node error, or that is not node error, node error. So weak interference is when the uh, voltage input voltage to the to a gate is at like zero point five volts, mm -hmm. and so both transistors are kind of on. They're both beyond the threshold voltage, but they're not on very strong. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next problem is. Um, Dynamic mode. I think I may have messed up this example. In order to trigger a dynamic node on C, you would need to um, change the production rules. I think maybe the goal of this wasn't the, the dynamic node, but the weak instability or the weak interference. Because you have, to get a dynamic node, you have to actually find a a portion of state space which isn't covered. Correct. And PRSIM assumes that if the node is dynamic, then there's a keeper that is maintaining the value. Mm -hmm. So PRSIM cannot simulate dynamic nodes. Okay. Even if the keeper is zero. Okay. The keeper equals zero is a flag specifically for the comp compiler down to the netlist. Mm -hmm. So also, even if PRSIM could simulate dynamic nodes, uh, if you're looking for a dynamic node on C, that would mean that some portion of the state space that uh, contributes to either C high or C low would have to not be fully specified by the uh, production rules. Correct. And 
C would have value. to be non-combinational hmm. or stakeholder. Which doesn't appear to be, and C high is uh, in or of two equal values. And this one's equal values and C low draws from the inverse of that same single value, which drives it high. So, uh, which means trace back to what what drives D. Like the truth table seems to be fully filled out. Yes, which means that it's not possible to create a floating node on C. Okay. So I think the, the to do here was an error. Okay. Uh, and that's what we can hear. Okay. So let's see the analog simulation of that. Make E2. CD2. All right. Pearson. R M dot PRS and source Pearson dot RC. And it runs. Let's take a look at our analog simulation. We have our input nodes A and B. And then we have our internal node D. And finally, we have our output node C. And let's measure this with respect to ground and VDD. On both. And you can see that there is a glitch on D. And that glitch does technically propagate out to C, but not enough to make any significant impact. It's lessened by the, the inverter. So we have to be careful of, of these. The bigger the glitch, the bigger the danger. PR sim is very conservative about handling glitches. It will not assume that they die down like this. Which node is x dot cone three? Uh, x dot cone three is going to be some internal node. Uh, test dot spy. Let's take a look at that dot spy. Um, it looks like it's one of the drivers for D. It's this node right here. Because there are nodes along the um, a sequential stack of transistors, right? Each connection point is another node. Does that make sense, Spencer? Yeah, it was um it was looking like a dynamic node in my analog simulation, so I was wondering why. Yeah, um, and they can be dynamic. Uh, for example, if, if A is zero, that node will be dynamic. There, All right. There are ways to add like free charges to those nodes if they turn out to be a problem. Um, so if there's a decent amount of capacitance there, then we can add a free charge so that that capacitance doesn't create some kind of glitch downstream. But I won't be covering that in these lectures. You can find that in the ACT tutorial at Yale. <laughs> 